Information about the world of running, inspiration to fuel passion and excellence, and ideas for making connections and finding community. You're listening to A to Z Running. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the A to Z Running Podcast, where we help runners thrive. I'm Andy. And I'm Zach. And before we tell you why we're wearing these, you need to head over to a to z running.com and click follow and then jump on YouTube, search up a to z running and subscribe so that you can connect with all of the things that we are doing. And by the way, while you're connecting with the platforms, you should also get engaged with the people. We keep saying yeah. it. Join the conversation, comment, and all of that kind of stuff on all of those places. And better still, we'll be able to once and for all settle one of our spousal debates, which is do people listen or watch podcasts more? And so you got to get interactive and get on YouTube and we can figure that whole thing out. And then, of course, we will feature some of your thoughts on the episode just to enrich the conversation further. Like this comment from Benjamin, who was talking about Kipchoge. And we're going to get to that in mm -hmm. the London Marathon. And he said, Kipchoge's an amazing guy. The London Marathon will be and was so exciting. And then he mentioned that NN Running Team had this vote challenge thing to win a signed singlet for the person who could predict who wins and what time they will win the London Marathon in, which was an, an enrichment because I didn't know that. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that, Benjamin. Now, of course, at this exact moment, I'm wondering if anyone got anywhere close to the right answer of who would win and what time. But we'll tell you more about that when we get to the world of running. We also have one other comment because we didn't share one last week, so we could give you double, double this week. And this was a bonus comment from Ernest. This week, he was commenting on a Strava post of mine where we got into a little bit of a debate with several of us about healthy sweets. <laughs> healthy with air quotes. And he said, in response to my comment about there's no such thing, he said, I couldn't agree more. Please don't make me eat healthy sweets. I love healthy sweets. But Ernest, that's all the proof I need. Because if it's healthy, it ain't a sweet. Okay. And if it's sweet, it shouldn't be healthy. Oh, goodness. Well, I disagree. And I'm going to no, sneak chia no. seeds and everything. So, <laughs> And we'll see how that goes two or three hours later. So thank you for getting engaged, getting involved. We need that because it makes this experience better. Now, that brings us to... These. Once again, the greatest sunglasses on the planet. <laughs> also, the friendliest with your pocketbook. Yeah. And we love knockarounds. We love them a lot, so much so that we have a lot of them. And these are our latest installment because Knockaround added a new feature later in the summer. And so it was something that uh, many who got the first wave didn't have this new feature, which was for the running versions, the fast lanes, they call them. They've got this little rubber just a little pad right inside the nose guard keeps it from slipping down your face. And I can prove to you that it does indeed work. Um, and it, it would just be especially valuable in those hot summer days when we come around to the next round of summers, uh, because of that all the sweating and such, they don't slip at all. Oh. Great installment by knock. Around. Thank you for sending them to us. Knock around. They're awesome. So you should get a pair head to knock around. Mm -hmm. You'll love them. Mm -hmm. This week in the world of running, we have the London Marathon to talk about. It is a world major and was available to the elites this year, and it didn't disappoint. Did not disappoint. So we have two general reactions before we say anything specific. First is weather mattered mm -hmm. because the rain, it wasn't necessarily cold, but it was definitely chilly yeah. and rainy, very wet, yeah. which is unpleasant and horrible for 26 miles and they're making a lot of turns and that matters yeah. too because they're pushing off in this wetness yeah not ideal so anytime anytime you see a race that's slower especially at the elite level and many of you know this um there's a higher likelihood for sprint finishes mm -hmm. which is our general reaction number two there were indeed in fact in both the men's and the women's races sprint finishes in the top three <laughs> crazy amazing i'm going to link to the recaps by NBC. I can't promise they'll still be there by the time you go to look, but I'm going to put in all my effort so that you can see this because it will definitely geek you out for, for racing that we've been missing so much. 
So the thing that everyone knows if they're following news stuff, because this is the thing that everyone's writing about, is that Kipchoge didn't win the men's race, and Bekele didn't even show up. He was injured. And so that epic showdown that we were hoping for uh, not only didn't happen, but the end results were, weren't anywhere in the ballpark. But there was an epic showdown. But there were epic <laughs> results. Yeah, Shura Katata, congratulations. He is the one who won. And it, he's not out of nowhere. Like, no. this guy is a fabulous marathoner. In fact, in 2018, in the London Marathon, he was runner-up. To Kipchoge. Yes. So clearly he's got it. And when Kipchoge is not in the race, he's definitely one you're going to look at. Mm-hmm. But he did not win by much. Because it was a kick By in the end. how much? One second. One second. One so, second in the marathon. <laughs> here's the way this always goes down when it happens like this. You can see the guys who are in it and want it because you're getting near the end of the race and no one's pulling ahead still. So then it's just becoming a question of who is not going to die, right? But at this level, they've always got something more. Yeah. You just you can't you can't just try to hold on. And so this is what happened. And it was actually Kipchumba. Is it Vincent Kipchumba? Mm -hmm. Kipchumba was the one who actually made the move. And I don't know exactly how far they were from the finish, but like 200-ish meters. He made the move and he made it strong. Yeah. And he put, he burned the guys. He looked dominant. He yeah. looked like he had it. But Katata stayed just close enough that when Kipchumba's burn was running out, because it was running out before the line, Katata had one extra thing and buried him just suddenly right before the line yeah by a second buried yeah, he, by he, a he second bury, he buried him yeah. with in only like 10 meters though exactly. so he, he mm -hmm. barely got away from him but that wasn't even it because there was a third one still there too yeah four seconds was the spread with the men's race. four seconds from mm -hmm. first to third place in an elite marathon majors crazy yeah the women's race zach <laughs> it wasn't that different i know it was another <laughs> exciting race so first place was the favorite, which was Bridget Koske, world record holder, and all of the other things. She's got a few world, world records, an, mm -hmm. another new one recently. So um, she's she's a favorite, you know, for this kind of a situation. But she was racing against a star-studded field, one of them being the defending world champion. And so in any of those kinds of situations, you don't just assume that she's going to win. So there was a point in time where the the world champion defending was actually pulling away yeah. from Bridget Koske. And, and you Chef can hear McGay it in the announcers. Yeah. You can hear it in the announcers. They're talking about it like, uh, I don't know if she can hang on. Like, it looks like she's losing ground. Yeah. But she stayed close and she reeled her back in and then she put on the punishing mm -hmm. move. So this is this is the strategy. I love talking race strategy too. <laughs> Andy knows this. When you're the one behind, when you're trailing and the person ahead starts to not necessarily fade, but starts to ease off the gas, that's the best time to go. And she executed it in the worst possible way, <laughs> just painfully. Yeah. And so she ended up winning the race by like four minutes, yeah. <laughs> three or four minutes. It was, she pulled way ahead. But there was but. a surprise and <laughs> excitement for that second place finish where Sarah Hall, an American, pulled the second place finish which is awesome so the the stat is the last time an american has podiumed at london was dina castor in 2006 mm -hmm. she was also the winner but um so that's 14 years without a podium finish at london and sarah hall pulled it off but the way she pulled it off yeah this woman has grit you need to watch the race just to see her grit like she was pushing hard and did not look comfortable but she gave it everything she had she got a 15 second pr in horrible conditions oh, yeah and she ran a lot of it alone yeah and, which and was fact, admirable right and and some like it this way so this is this is always a question mark does sarah hall like to do this because what it was is she was the hunter so yeah. she was alone, but she was picking off the competition mm -hmm. very slowly, one at a time, grabbing them to the point where the last one she finally picked off was at the time in second place was Cheptegay. And she caught her like 20 meters before the line mm -hmm. and just just sprinted past her. Sprinted like amazing crazy. cake. I want to know her last like 200 meter split, 400 meter well, Mild, it always looks more was, impressive like, than the numbers actually uh, are. I because, bet it was impressive <laughs> compared to, uh, yeah, the things yeah, that I do. <laughs> especially at the end of a marathon. Who knows? Yeah. Absolutely. So Sarah Hall, congrats, but she's not the only American to show yeah. some stuff in the race. Molly Seidel, congratulations to Molly. She ran, this is her first 
major marathon. Her first world major. This so is her second you marathon, should, You period. should recall her name because she was one of the qualifiers for the Olympics at the U.S. trials mm-hmm. in her debut marathon in right. Atlanta last year. So this was no small potatoes. No. It was also another PR. Right. My goodness. 225-13. Put her in sixth place. Sixth place. So the Americans Solid. went second and sixth in a world marathon majors, which is very impressive, especially in an elite field like this one was. Yep. Well, we have more on the world of running that we'll bring to you next week. Okay, so for our main topic, what we're doing here, and this is going to be representative of this next year in how we're structuring the podcast, which is we're going to bring to you a question and and posing that question, attempt to answer it Mm -hmm. in a compelling manner. So we figured a great question to address, one that is practical for every single one of us is what is the best way to mobilize? Mm-hmm. So you've heard us talking about it. It's actually number two on our three keys to thriving, the A to Z running, running foundations. So it's important. Mobility is important. And it's probably the key to maintaining longevity in the sport as well, yeah. to being healthy and to being able to day after day go out and, and hit the grind. And we don't say that because it's impossible. You know, there's a lot of runners out there who say, I've never stretched for 25 years. And yeah, that's that's probably possible and true. But how good do you feel during the first mile of your run? <laughs> that's always a question that I, that's the first the question first I five, ask. You mean whatever people say, like right? <laughs> whatever people say, oh, I never stretched. I'm always like, well, how good do you feel when you're running? Um, because it's true that you can feel better if you're not stretching. Um, but it's not just stretching. And that's where we wanted to start here. So what is actual mobility and, you know, the best way to do it? So to answer the question... First, I want to start with some of Jay DeSherry's work because we've talked about it before and it's a really important clarifying factor, which is he, in Running Rewired, he talks about there are really kind of three types of immobility or three things that immobilize us. Uh, we have the joint-related inhibitions, which um, it, you f- it feels differently than just like tight muscles. It's not the same kind of thing. Mm-hmm. But especially tightness around and in your joints is one kind of thing. You have myofascial adhesion, which is the principle of the fascia overlaying the muscle tissue, and they're not running fluidly. Instead, they're doing like the... And so if you're listening, you're not seeing my wonderful hand gestures to describe this. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, they're great, Zach. <laughs> yeah, great. So myofascial in- adhesions um, cause immobility. And then you have just general muscle tissue tissue length. So if your tissues are too short for the range of that you're trying to accomplish. Um, and so those are three different types of immobility, which you might guess you don't mobilize them in the same way. So we have to answer the question a little bit more complicated, but that is to say, I feel, and I think most runners agree that there are certain things that we probably need as a part of our regular routine often, if not mm-hmm. all the time, every day. Mm-hmm. And those kinds of things are myofascial release types of things because it's the only way to really get the fascia broken up and straightened out. And that's like foam rolling and the lacrosse ball stuff. You know, manual manipulation is good as well. And we've talked about sidekick tools. We love them. They've got like some of the vibrating things and some of the scrapers. All that stuff is myofascial release types of things. Very effective. But then you also need some effective dynamic mobility Mm -hmm. types of routines and exercises. And there's a lot of contradictory opinions out there about this stuff like static stretching for instance is it good is it bad well you've heard us talk about it we feel like it's bad in general (laughs) but that doesn't actually mean that it's bad all the time period um also like dynamic mobility yoga any you know what are the other kinds of things that make you feel like you've stretched um i think lydiard used to call it suppling (laughs) suppling what does that even mean so In order to answer that well, we felt like the best way to do so is to bring on an expert. In fact, the... The world-leading expert. World-leading musculoskeletal expert Mm -hmm. who also happened to found, as we understand it today, active, isolated flexibility, Mm -hmm. and that is Phil Wharton. Yeah, we are so honored to have him on the podcast today. I mean, he's been in the New York Times. He's been on the Discovery Channel, Runner's World. I mean... USA Today, everybody, and we get him on the A to Z running podcast. So we are absolutely 
thrilled honored honored all of the above absolutely and he has a lot of products so it's the wharton health um you can find him at wharton health on instagram too but he has put out a bunch of books and i'm going to share them with you here the wharton stretch book that's the one that we have talked about quite a bit on this show we actually gave it away in a giveaway uh the wharton strength book the wharton cardio fitness book and the wharton back book <laughs> But in addition to that, we just don't we don't have all the time to like go through every resource that he has because it is grand. I'm going to be linking to them all and you will get a discount. This is thank yes. you, Phil. Thank you so Thanks, much. Phil. It's A Z running is the code. A Z running so for fifteen percent off. Yes. At the discount code on his website. And we'll get into some of that as well. But uh, Phil Wharton is has so much expertise yeah. and he's gonna tell you as much of that expertise as we could fit into a single interview. Mm -hmm. So without further ado, our interview with Phil. Hi, Phil. Welcome to the A to Z Running Podcast. Hello, Andy. Hello, Zach. It's great to be here. Good to meet you all. Pleasure. Great to meet you as well. So I have to tell just this brief backstory. I didn't prepare you for this ahead of time, Phil, but um, active isolated flexibility hit me early in my post college running when it was kind of that period and you and you're familiar with the concept that period where I'm not part of a team anymore I don't have any of the supports that come with being part of a college team you know the athletic trainers and all of those kinds of things I'm on my own and I was trying to do steeplechase at an Olympic level that was my my goal and I was having a hard time I was having a hard time staying fluid and being able to you know, compete aggressively with jumps and just couldn't take care of myself. And I found, it, I hit a video and it was an accident. I don't remember what I was looking for, but I wasn't looking for this. But I hit a video where someone, it was maybe Jay Johnson or something, had mentioned the Whartons and something about their mobility technique. And from then on, I have been sold. So I, I bought the book, I got ropes, I, I started following your DVDs and it's just been it's Thank been you, wonderful. Zach. That, that makes me feel good that I've was able to reach you and even not meet you. And what year was that that you, if you don't mind oh, dating yeah. yourself <laughs> or if you, if well, you, if you want to, <laughs> I can go way no, back. No, no. It's okay. <laughs> you know, somewhere around 2011, cause I was trying to get ready for the 2012 Olympic trials. That was my goal. Yes. Well, I'm glad you, and hopefully you're still, you're still on the rope and utilizing some of the principles now in your training daily. Uh, <laughs> good, good. I love it. I love it. I love it. Well, steeple is one of the toughest, as you know, and we've got two and a half to five times our body weight without hurdles. So imagine, mm. you know, you have the water jump and the hurdles and, you know, so I've, I've, you know, it's always one of those events that you're at the trials and you're cringing because one of your friends is doing something that, you know, in, in any minute there's <laughs> something can happen, you know, so you're always like, it's one of my favorite events because it's so grueling. It's so amazing. And it's just, it's a neat, neat sweet spot between endurance and speed, speed of a miler, endurance of a 10 K runner, you know, but it's all also the nerve wracking, you know, so kudos to you for being able to be a steeplechaser and, and it, it yeah. helps you with a lot of other aspects of your life now, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, you know, that, that, that's a good point. That's a good point. We could probably spend the rest of the episode talking about those kinds of things right there. Um, yeah, and it's, you know, that with anything, it, when you add in the challenge factors, you know, whatever the, those may be, um, it accentuates your problem areas, your weaknesses. And I noticed that pretty quickly on as, as a steeplechaser, certainly did. So, Phil, our goal here, and we appreciate you coming on to really address um, from your area of expertise here, and you have a vast area of expertise, um, addressing and helping address the question of what is the best way to do mobility. As we think about runners, how to do these kinds of things well, um, we know there's some good research out there about practices that can be effective and ineffective and all of that, um, but, but we also know that you've got a, a, a niche that you've developed really effectively to great success with many athletes and yourself included, we should say too. Mm -hmm. So we want to get into that a bit and what you've developed and how you've come to establish the the reasons why this is effective and then what that looks like when we're trying to do it well. Sounds great. No, I'm, um, I think that's a great overview. Yes. So let's let's start with active isolated flexibility. What is that? Okay. Well, very good. So what we're doing here with active flexibility is we're uh, realizing that it's neurological. Uh, we're ha we have to use the central nervous system, which is what we do in our training. So it's very congruent with what we would do in athletics and distance running, especially in locomotion in general. Um, 
I guess Charles Sheridan, the, the famous uh, neurophysiologist, it was something like 1854, 1856, coined reciprocal innervation. And, and that's the idea that an agonist muscle works, an antagonist muscle relaxes and lengthens across the joint. So, you know, if I move my arm up, let's say the bicep is, is, is contracting, the tricep has to relax and lengthen to do that. So those are the kind of principles, this natural phenomenon, is which we, want, we would like to follow in our mobility program. So it's, it's, it's a lot like, I guess, the nutrition arena, right? We get, we get stuck on, I'm a this label, I'm a that label. Uh, it really it comes down to biochemistry. And the same with physiology. It, we're all put together basically the same. We have a, a lot different postural alignment challenges and genetic predisposition of our muscle fibers. But we all need to approach mobility from a similar standpoint that we realize that, okay, it's activation. So that's the, that's the first reason we call it active is we want to elicit that nervous system response, which we can't do. And luckily, uh, you know, in your all's era and, 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 and the younger kids coming up today, especially, they never grew up, grow, grew up doing this stuff like this, where I don't know if you can see, but I've got a leg up on this table. <laughs> And, you know, I, I, I am stretching, you know, I've got that hamstring in a stretch position, but I'm using my back muscles against a two joint hamstring across the gastrocnemius, across the lower attachment, across the digital tuberosity there. And I, you know, in the past, we thought we could override that reflex in the body that stops us from overstretching, which is one of your questions, the myotatic stretch reflex. And it never happens. And that's what the good news about, uh, about this era is we have now research that's finally proven that loss of peak force and we, we, we inhibit that muscle fiber. It goes into a protective mechanism based on the perceived velocity or is there going to be harm? Is there going to be edema damage to the tissue? So with this simple program, we, basic principles, we activate one muscle group at a time. We isolate as best as possible across a joint, especially in a vulnerable joint intersection where we've got a lot of muscles, ligaments, tendons, tissue, deep fascia, which we can't access even from the best implements sometimes. The, you know, the tools are great. We all use them in our therapy practice, but there's nothing like really working a full range of motion in a hamstring context where we're on our back you know, instead of even, instead of even swinging, which the dynamic is fantastic. And in certain contexts, we'll get into that too, but we can overstretch. And we see a lot of that where people aren't quite as trained. They aren't quite as impeccable with their form, right? And so they're going into a scorpion position or they're going into this and that, and they're kind of flailing. They've lost control. And, and, and so we really love the active isolated. We, we do like people to watch the videos. It's, it's not about the sales of that. It's about doing things properly because it's like, oh yeah, I know rope stretching. I have a rope. It's not about the rope. It's about our body. The rope just facilitates at the end of the movement. So with active flexibility, you know, we're, we're, we're identifying the muscle fiber to be relaxed and lengthened. Notice I didn't say stretch. It's not just a play on words. <laughs> it's about that reciprocation, right? So the, the agonist muscle. Then we don't want to hold the position so we don't violate that myotatic stretch reflex. And that can happen within a half a second. Everybody's proprioception is so different genetically we say one to two seconds in the book so that people don't rush things so, okay but you never hold the, the real answer is you're making continuous movement at towards your end range when you get there where you feel the stretch that's basically it in that what we call reflex arc zone then you go back to start position what you're doing is you're getting more vascularity you're pumping new blood and oxygen you're getting those metabolites out you're recirculating and that's really the key so we, there's so many great benefits i mean like you said we could talk a, a, too long about that but it's very easy to apply and and you can do a basic routine you know in in 15 minutes as you found when you got into it or 12 minutes some of the athletes for the whole hip and trunk uh so yeah it's it's it's, uh, it's activation, activation isolation, it's not holding positions, it's, it's actually um, asking and talking to the body instead of telling it what to do. I think that's really important also because you're, it, for me, it's kind of my MRI. 
it, it, I'm, I'm watching your range of motion, and I know what inherent range of motion should be at each joint. So if I see, and, and people start to learn, even in the book, it shows you where, you're, where you are on that dial. And if you're not there, you know you've got to put a little more homework in. And so it gives people a self-test uh, when they don't have a, a therapist to pull out of their pocket if they're in Europe or wherever, and they, you know, somebody, uh, they don't, don't have somebody traveling with them. So, that, so that's really good. Um, and, and it's, and we use about eight to 10 reps gang too. uh, very similar to weight training, especially larger musculature in the femoral head and around the hip joint where we have contracted tissue. When we get into the neck or foot ankle, uh, we could do less reps and still have a good quality workout. So that was, uh, that was the first, I went off into other directions. So sorry, but thank you. No, that's excellent. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and we've we've mentioned it before to you phil we appreciate the depth and the detail and i think our audience does as well because it i noticed that yeah i noticed that in your other shows so i i, I was okay i think good yes absolutely <laughs> um you know i am i'm curious i want to give you a very specific example to how you would speak directly to the person saying this um so obviously the concept then of static stretching as you were articulating with some of the stretch reflex and some of those kinds of things um talk to me about your response to Someone who says, I've had plantar fascia pain, you know, I've had plantar pain for years and I was told, oh, it's my calves, they're too tight and such. And so I started stretching my calves, holding one, two minute stretches every day and my, my plantar fascia pain is gone. Now, <laughs> what do we say then in that situation? We say great because first of all, we don't want people to stay in a pain response because we want to get them out running. And, you know, you don't want to get too stuck, even though even if you have a method that works with great efficacy, um, some people get results by doing things and by releasing tissue. Now, is there a better way to address the calf instead of pushing against the VW? Of course, <laughs> as an agonist works, it works an antagonist relaxes. So, if if they would take take the rope and be and be on and be seated, right? If they're, if they're talking about their outer calf, let's say gastrocnemius, which is a it's just a big player. I would, I would really want to go with the soleus first because that's the deeper pancake muscle that slides and glides underneath. And a lot of the old medical texts really call it a second heart because it's the one that really pumps into that lower extremity. So I would simply just use the tibialis anterior, the shin muscle, the foot flexors to bring the foot up. It's a lot easier. You After three or four reps, okay, I'm not feeling anything. Well, you could take your fingers and palpate in there and you'll feel underneath your fingertips where that deep soleus is. Then you know, okay, something's happening. I've got some more blood flow. I notice, okay, the range of motion of my foot is better. See, I've got more, you know, a, a dorsal flexion. Then I go into the lock-in position. I've got the rope doubled up. And then you can place the rope at the ball of the foot and go into the deeper gastroc. So, that would be a little bit better, easier way to target uh, that. And then specifically for the plantar fascia, uh, you know, you can change the angles, get a little eversion in there. Um, also, I would use a, a soft tissue release where you take your thumbs and you get in between just off the bone and you'll feel all those adhesions on the bone. And then you can just uh, it, it just drop in gently, almost like make your hands like a magnet and you'll feel all those five, you'll feel all those little bundles, all those little micro tears, or sometimes uh, the fascia will bundle up and, and then you can release it and you'll feel so much more vascularity. And then, and then you'd want to strengthen that area. But, but no, to, 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 to answer the question, um, if someone's getting results, we, we love that. We love that. And we don't want to get stuck on, okay, something could be better, but then there's people like the feeling. They love to stretch. Okay, yoga. Yoga is a fabulous way to, to get healing, to get relaxation. I worked with, when I was in Arizona for years, I worked with a community in Sedona and they were longtime meditators. And that's where I learned to meditate and do my meditation with them. And they said, Phil, you know, we've been sitting in postures for years in India. And our bodies are so shot from this, teach us how to rebalance. So we taught them the active flexibility. And then they went back to the yoga because then they got rebalanced. They got flexible and strong, but we don't want to use, you know, so 
we're sort of, it's sort of using it improperly in the West, right? We're using yoga to attain range of motion. We need range of motion to enjoy deeper postures, to release energy, to move into meditation through yoga. So it becomes this fractured thinking, right? Oh, you know, the wardens are against yoga or they're against this. Well, no, you know, if, I mean, if static stretching worked better, I would be using it. It's about performance. What, what, what works, right? Uh, but some people do like the feeling of it. So we want to prepare them actively to do hold positions. Like we noticed working with ballet dancers and they have to be on bar. So we prepare them before. So they do their active routines before, then they get on the ballet and they do the work and then they're fine because they've already been past that with the reflex arc in a good prep. Uh, so very good question. I think, Zach, it, it's something that comes up a lot. Um, and you probably get this a lot with people say, you know, I want to do, I just want to do my stretch and this feels good to me, you know, and, and, and that's okay. Hey, is there a better way? Sure. They may never get to that. That's okay. Also. So if, and I'm assuming you have thoroughly convinced anyone listening that this is definitely an effective approach to things. Um, I, I think I'm really curious at this point, yeah. what's the, how much and when, then when, when do you do this? How often do you do this? How much time do you spend doing it? What does that and, look like? And, and that's a great question that you all, that you're all asking. And okay. In a perfect world, let, let's say, you know, the Mebs of the world, okay. You get a call from Meb. You say, Hey, Phil, it's right. It's like three weeks before Athens. And, you know, he's, he's getting his oil changed and he's on the park benches. I'm doing the flexibility, you know, before and after everything, even sitting in the car. And I feel, now he's a professional athlete. He was a silver medalist. He was getting ready to do all this stuff. He has more time. A lot of times there is time that we sort of drift into a mode of this or that, the <laughs> texting and whatever. So a lot of times we have more time than we think. But no, the ultimate is before and after, a little bit before and after, before we prep the body. Now, how, how are you saying to stretch before? Isn't it always after? If stretching statically, we'd always want to warm up. That's where a lot of our college teams, when I came through University of Florida, same thing. We did your two-lap jog, then your mobility, then your, you know, all that. Well, we can skip that because as an agonist works, if I'm using that quadricep, so that's my warm up. Instead of the walk jog, I've got that quadricep working in hip flexor. And now at the end of the movement, I'm relaxing and lengthening the hamstrings. So one muscle group at a time, I'm prepping. It's way more efficient than tight muscles, even moving on a treadmill or a, a bike, a spin bike. Uh, so that would be good. If, uh, you know, and then if, okay, so forget the perfect world. You have no time at all. You're sort of flat line. And a lot of these people that I work with, investment people, these women and these men like in New York, and they're just full on, right? And so we get them doing a little bit of mobility first, meaning, you know, some, some dynamic work under control where they're really purposeful about using an agonist to swing a limb using an antagonist and doing the same positions here. I'm working the pectoralis group, but I'm not into a normal active. I say where to hold more, I'm more doing a dynamic and it goes a little quicker. Then after your day is over, let's say, and you're, you're almost ready to go to sleep. You'll get a better night's sleep. You'll be more efficient. You'll get more circulation. You'll flush the metabolic waste from the day. Stresses from the day sometimes are worse than training, right? So we, we get all that lymphatic drain and everything going and reboot, reset. And, and so that can be the way to do it. Uh, you know, if, if the workouts in the morning, a lot of times with people that are uh, on, on, a, on a type A, you know, they're moving fast. They've got a lot and they're living full lives. And then they don't get to it until the evening. That's fine. They're still going to get that flush and better recovery. So, uh, you know, great questions in a perfect world. Let's say on our weekends when we have more time, when I'm advising people, I said, hey, why don't we do 10 minutes before that, uh, that, that long run or activity and then 10 minutes after and you'll, and that'll be 20 minutes really well spent while you are prep before less injury. It, it'll be about consistency. Well, I don't have the time. Well, we don't have time to be injured. So I like people to get in the habit, right? Uh, of course, I'm, I'm trying to brainwash people now in a, in a good way, but I like people to get into the habit of, Hey, I'm finding myself doing this. It's not, it's not a grind. 
not even for elites. I get, you know, I don't want you to use willpower. That's too much. That's too much glucose. I want you to just be into this because this is your lifestyle. And you know what? It doesn't have to be an elite athlete or professional athlete for this to be a lifestyle. I'm a recreational athlete now and it's my lifestyle. I love to do it. Nobody's paying me. There's no, nobody's waking me up. But every day I go out and, and now I'm 53, I'm an old person and I love to, you know, I do long runs of two and a half hours and two hours and up and down the mountains. And I still do what I love to do because I take care of my body. I invest in the musculoskeletal work, the flexibility and the strength, rebalancing. And so it's really important, gang, really. Uh, it'll just, cha it'll change your life. It'll give you longevity. Uh, you know, as you found, uh, you know, getting ready for the trials, it, it, it's, it, it's, a, it's a game changer for people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So true. And you know, that, that just, that fits so well with the vision. Phil, we talk all the time with our audience about what we're trying to do, Andy and I, what we're trying to do in the A to Z running brand is just helping runners thrive. We keep using the word thrive, um, you know, because we're talking about people who are aspiring for like Olympic trials, marathon times, and yes. people who are just wanting to run a 5k. And so, you know, the, the concept is the same for everyone. We want to thrive. And this kind of a thing is such an important piece in the puzzle of what it means to thrive. I, I believe that too. And I, I felt that when you all reached out to me. So I, I felt we were kindred spirits in that. So thanks for, <laughs> for telling me because I felt that. And, and so this is great. This makes a lot of sense. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So you, you gave us a couple of examples. You showed us a few different things. I'm curious if there are there a certain few things where you were to say to runners, these are kind of the essentials of what you want to try to address in a regular practice for runners? Yes. And, you know, if, if we pare it down, it was interesting. Our friend Dick Patrick was a famous sports writer for USA Today and was years and years on the, on the track beat. And um, we, we had uh, three, three flexibility exercises in that piece, hamstrings, uh, quad, and low back. Even just those three can be really, really powerful if you only have, so you're talking about one to two minutes, maybe two minutes per exercise. So, you know, six minutes or so um, can, can really be helpful. I really find that um, I, I, do, I do love the hamstring uh, for, for the athletes, you know, posterior muscles there. The glute typically is shut down because of the lack of hip flexion. They're not activating. Also, from the, from the pandemic standpoint, a lot of the collegiate and the high school athletes that I'm advising now are online again. And so there's more compression. So they're, they're not getting up throughout the day to do the normal things. So we see a lot of, of, of deactivated gluteals. So, um, you know, if they could get hamstrings, glutes, Quadricep, get, it gets overloaded because we're more flexor dominant. We're not using the muscles behind us, the anti-gravity muscles to swing. So um, if you could get, you know, hamstrings, glutes, um, quads, uh, outer calf and low back, that would be pretty optimum. Um, and, and those, you know, those, those five or six, it goes pretty quick. I, I love the hip and trunk program that you're probably doing what people have colloquialized as the rope stretching. Um, that zone one protocol is fabulous. And it's, it's about 16 exercises. You do get it down, you know, you pare it down. How long does it take you to do that program? Yeah. You uh, 15 to 20 minutes if I'm doing it slowly. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So, and that, and that's a good point that you just brought up Zach is pacing uh, you can you can speed up the program before especially if you're about for your athletes that work out you know if you're about to have a workout get yourself a little bit more kin kinetically tuned in as we would do with our sprinters we would speed things up we want a little more neural control and that's where the dynamic this becomes a type of controlled dynamic obviously because it is dynamic as well then afterwards when your when your session's over or your race is over that's where you slow down and you're more into the restorative pace and, and you're taking your time you're making sure you're locking in at the joints and you're going through that full range uh being a little more impeccable with your form so those can also be good tips for people that are more advanced with this work um we always see form issues you know with people mm. um because it's very easy <laughs> and, and because it, it 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 is simple which which is the blessing but also that's the double-edged sword is people sort of flail around and flop and they don't so do do watch the videos do get the book 
do you look at the nuance because just by not externally rotating the femur and going across the midline, you're not going to get that IT band and that upper TFL and that glute medius, which is, you know, that is so contracted that, you know, a lot of times iliotibial band syndrome, how many of your uh, listeners, you know, and, and, and community have, have had those kind of things. A lot of these labels and injuries, once we get a, a good, clear diagnosis, we know what it is. This is a very effective tool. Uh, to employ. And it's, and it's really great during a pandemic when it's hard to access a good practitioner. I mean, I haven't worked since March uh, mm -hmm. in, in the room with people consulting and everything has been via video. So, uh, and, and the good news about that is uh, people really have to take the personal responsibility. So that, so that's good. So you, so you sort of, you always want to look, what's the silver line? The bad part is bad that we can't be with people, but the good part is, Hey, there's things that work. And so we want them to know how to do it properly. That's rich. Yeah, absolutely. And we're grateful to you that you have offered a 15% off discount to our listeners. We're really excited about that. We're going to be linking to all the ways, um, actually all of these resources. Mm -hmm. And then also the code for that, which is AZ running that you use at checkout. So we're going to be linking to all of that. And we'll probably even put it in some text right here. Yeah, do do share that because there's a lot of free resources on there. A lot of the videos that you probably saw initially, um, you know, up there. We, we did a running times piece with Scott Douglas um, some years ago, right around that time, maybe in 2011, I think it came on out. And so those kinds of things are out there. We had some columns with Runner's World and Running Times for years. And, and we have links to all that. There's a, there's a library section in there. And there's also a free app too, that they can, if they're on iOS, uh, on iTunes, they can get the app and they can go through everything. It has sort of a primary and then a, and a secondary uh, way that they can address an issue or they can go in just by, you know, range of motion or whatever. So there, there's some good, good stuff in there that they can do. And, and we have a, a streaming channel that has all that stuff and, uh, and all the books are digital and, and hard copy. So there's good, good, good uh, resources there that they can uh, tune into. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, it, you know, if I if I just kind of reflect then, Phil, as we wrap it up here and distilling it all down, um, the thing that always stands out to me with this kind of thing is um, the the emphasis on control and precision. That's yes. just throughout, you know, throughout the practice. Um, I, I, I saw that in my initial exposure to it, however many years ago, and started to realize so quickly that that concept is so important throughout all of the things that I was doing. So I started to think about it when I was in the weight room, I started to think about it and, and it just, you know, it drew a huge level of impact across all of the running related things I'd been doing. That's awesome. No, that, you know, I think these, these essential tenets, you know, these doctrines are, they sort of transcend just, you know, you know, when I was advising a young high school athlete recently, who's just got the light bulb and is so excited for him because he was able to go to Colorado this, you know, this summer and, you know, be at altitude and, you know, he's getting exposed. He wants to be a runner, you know, you know, and so you love when the young women and the young men and whatever age, right. But when they get, and so they want to, they're just like a sponge and they're absorbing all the information and they're doing it. And he, he said to me, you know, um, it, was, it was so great. He says, Phil, I just want to be like the tortoise, you know? And I said, you know, this is so great. Some people out there say, well, no, I want to be the hare. No, but remember the tortoise gets there first and enjoys their process and enjoys the journey. And so he's making it fun and he's embracing all these little things and think about what's going to happen in his life. It's, it's going to be such a juicy life because he's, you know, th these are things that you're taking on in all the elements it's, it's attention to detail. And that I think is the path of excellence. And it's not about how fast we go. It's how much we enjoy the sport and, and, and staying healthy, you know, being injured is just, it's, it's heart wrenching, you know, and, and, and then, and, and especially now during difficult times, we need to be able to train guys. We have to train. I don't know about you. I know that you all did your training today. I mean, you know, right? I mean, you, yep. it, that sets you up. It sets the precedent for all the things that you do, uh, you know, moving your community. And, and, and it's a lot of hard work. And you're embracing that hard work. But the training really gives us the meditation. And, you know, it's not just for the body. There's a lot of uh, pleasure chemicals in the brain and all these things that are happening. So 
uh, so this is great that you've embraced that and we're we're all in the same alignment here well certainly thank you so much for your time for sharing your expertise and even some of your resources with our audience we're we're, we're so excited to bring this level of understanding to what we can do best and better when we're thinking about things like mobility and beyond in running. That's great. Well, it's been a pleasure meeting you, and uh, I hope to come back again and share in other stories. <laughs> Holy cow. Like, so much valuable information from Phil, and just even more that he has presented to us. He mentioned briefly this app that he was talking about. It's his flexibility app and I've downloaded it and I've begun using it and it is amazing because he has all the areas that you need to mobilize, how to do them. He shows a clip, like it is in depth and it is awesome. So I'm gonna link to that as well. So many links. So make sure you go to a to z running.com slash episode 53 for this episode's links. So really what we're talking about here is what is the best way to mobilize? We posed the question, we promised an answer. And if you don't feel like you have an answer yet, let me try to answer it for you as concisely as possible. And the answer is, it's complicated. (laughs) (laughs) Well, no, okay, I I should really give you an actual answer here. But really, mobilizing is a combination of things. And that's the most important thing we need to understand about it, too, is we in our routine, it's it's a regimen of we need the myofascial release types of stuff like foam rolling and such. And then we need manual manipulation types of things as a part of the process because there are certain areas that you just can't get quite right with just a foam roller and just with some active dynamic mobility. But then you also need, and I am a firm believer in active isolated flexibility in its varying forms, but certainly as Phil Wharton has laid out as probably the best way to accomplish all the rest of the types of things you need. And I really think, and this is, we mentioned it in the episode, but I just want to say it one more time for clarity that the value of growing this control and proprioception, which is the idea of just being aware of your movements, your body's movements, the idea of growing those things well and understanding how to be aware of that kind of thing when you're doing stuff like mobility and strength work and even while you're running, where you're out on the run, is so important when we talk about how to best accomplish feeling good while running. Mm -hmm. And that's the place to start. And then you can implement a whole bunch of different kinds of things. But our recommendation, as you see it there, check out Phil Wharton stuff. Yeah. Get into some active isolated flexibility. Get the rope for the guiding and go to work because it's easy to do. You can do it anywhere, anytime. And as Phil said, it also helps you sleep better at night. Yeah. Which that's... is great. <laughs> I need some of that in my life. Oh, and one more thing. The winner of the Instagram giveaway was Mild Penny. So congratulations to Mild. We do hope to have more giveaways coming up. But remember, you can get a discount with Sidekick Tool. And you can go to sidekicktool.com slash A to Z running to get 15% off. So we got more questions to answer, more compelling topics coming at you. And of course, get involved in the conversation so that the things we talk about can be that much more enlightened by your insights. We're on YouTube, A to Z Running, and go to a to z running.com. Look for the word follow.